Lord Jesus, we come before you. And I thank you, Lord, as I look out and I see smiling faces and I see faces that reveal anticipation, faces that uh, reveal maybe um, hope and uh, joy, especially on our four friends. I just see the love of God, and I thank you. I know you see it too. So my prayer, dear Father in heaven, is that you would indeed have your way with us today, that you would transform us today, that we indeed, as a result of what we hear and what we experience, that we would be more like Christ at the end of this day than we were uh, when we came. I pray that you would, not by any eloquent speech of mine, but by the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit, that your truths would be spoken and they would penetrate our hearts, go down deep and produce great fruit for your great glory. That's our prayer this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have your phones, uh, you can use them in, in church. Uh, you can access my PowerPoints by going to the www.thehomechurch.org slash teachings, and you can follow along with the PowerPoints, and you can also review them during the week if you'd like. And you just click on this Sunday's teaching. And as I said, we're going through the book of Colossians, and it's a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul, who you may or may not know. He came to faith after... Uh, Jesus had uh, been crucified, buried, and risen. And he was persecuting, as a Pharisee, the church. He was arresting them, putting them in prison, and executing many believers because of what he called blasphemy. He was a Pharisee, a Jew. And then he met Jesus. He met Jesus, and his life was changed. And ours was, too, as a result of, of the Apostle Paul's transformation. So he writes this letter from jail, and he writes it to the Colossian church, and he's writing to them to encourage them, to exhort them, and to challenge them. So our message today on baptism comes from that very book. But before we talk about baptism, uh, I want to remind you of what Jesus said. And, and this is what Jesus said as quoted by Matthew in the Gospel of Matthew. And this was a statement made by Jesus to his disciples right before he ascended into heaven. And this is what he gave them. He gave them this command. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, Jesus himself, and of the Holy Spirit. So that was his command to his disciples. And if you are a disciple, one who is Christ-filled, that's a command that has been made to you and to me. And as a pastor, that's what I'm called to do. I'm called to baptize and I tell you, that's my greatest privilege is to baptize new disciples. And so that's what we're doing today. We're following the command of Jesus, and we will baptize in the name of the Father, God, in the name of Jesus, his Son, God, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. These are three persons in one God, and that's what he's called us to do, and that's what we'll do today. The word... Uh, the Greek word for baptize is the Greek word baptizdo. Baptizdo, my wife is saying, you're not saying it right. I know I'm not, because I don't speak Greek. But, um, uh, but it's baptizdo, we'll say that, okay? That's the word we're using today. Uh, and as you look at it, what happened is this word, there was no word for it, they couldn't translate it from the Greek, so they transliterate it. Transliterate it means they took the Greek alphabet and essentially took this, the Greek alphabet and just converted it into our alphabet. And, and so the, the word baptizo is then uh, uh, converted to baptize. So, but it means, and at the time that it was written, it, mean, it meant, the word meant just to immerse, to wash, or to bathe. And at the time of the early church, 
uh, they would be involved in uh, a cleansing. That if somebody wanted to come to uh, Judaism, they would have to go through a ceremonial washing, a ceremonial baptism, a washing that would happen, but they would generally would be a, a, something they would do to themselves. But in the early church before Christ, you may have heard of John the Baptist and John the Baptizer. And they called him that. It wasn't his last name, and it wasn't because he was a Baptist and not a Presbyterian. I mean, it was because that's what he did. And so he was doing something very unique at the time. He was calling the world at the time out to him. It said all of Judea and Jerusalem were called to come, to come to where he was in this public setting in the Jordan River. He was there calling people to come and be baptized and he would take them, and he would immerse them in the water and bring them up. And he was baptizing them for the repentance of their sins. So he was doing this. This is, this is preceding Jesus. And so that's what the word became known as, is, is this then baptize, immersing, or washing? Um, and that act of plunging somebody into the water and bringing them out. In Colossians 2.12, which is really our key verse today, this is Paul as he's talking to the Colossians, and he says this, for you, you who are followers of Jesus, you who are filled with Christ, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. You were buried with him. And think about that. Think about a burial. And, and so as we proceed with the baptism today, think of what we will do, the plunging of Dean and Libby and Todd and Tracy. It's buried. It's, it, it's, a, it's an outward illustration of what's happened on the inside. And so that's why they go down under the water. It is like a burial. And that's what Paul says. This is what's happened to you as a follower of Christ. You were buried with him when you were baptized. It goes on to say, and with him you were raised. So it's not, you're not left there. You're not left in the tomb. You're not left in the grave because Jesus wasn't. And so I'm not going to leave them under the water, I promise. <laughs> So I will bring them out of the water. And I bring them out of the water as a sign of new life, as a sign of being raised from the dead, raised from the grave to new life in Christ. And that's what Paul says. With him, with Jesus, with whom you were buried, you were also raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. This word baptizo, pe baptizo, uh, <laughs> I can't get it right. Lord, forgive me. But what is it? Baptizo. There, my wife. Good. I, I, we've been married 34 years and I, I always can use help from her. Baptizo. Good. Baptizo. That's what she says. She's a Greek scholar, I'm sure. So... <laughs> Um, but what we, 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 we find out really what this word meant by looking at a poet and a physician, I think his name was Nicander, back in, in, in 200 uh, AD, so it was a after uh, Christ, but he wrote, and he actually wrote a recipe for making pickles, and as he's writing, he uses the word baptizo, and, but he says, first you take the vegetable, and you bapto it, not baptizo, you bapto it in uh, the water, and then you baptizo it in vinegar. And so bapto is a temporary change, just a temporary change. It's quick dipping. Baptizo reflects a permanent change, something that happens permanently. So then that's where the word baptism, baptizo, comes from. When we apply it to Christian baptism, we are revealing a permanent change that happens in an individual. So as we know, 
Paul says, For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. The word dead there is the Greek word nekros, and it means to be spiritually dead, destitute of life, force, or power, inactive or inoperative. And so when somebody is buried, they're buried after they're dead. And so when Paul is talking about death, he's saying that, that before Christ, we were dead in our trespasses. We were dead in our sin. We, we had upon us the sentence of death. And as a result, that we were spiritually dead, destitute of life, force, or power, inactive and inoperative. But as a result of his sacrifice, as a result of his death on that cross to pay for our sins and our transgressions, Paul says we are raised to new life. That means to be raised up together. So we are raised with Christ, raised together with him, to be roused from death, to revivify, revivify spiritually, to have a new spirit within us, a spiritual awakening. And he says, because you trusted. How did this happen, Paul? How does this spiritual event, this spiritual transformation happen? He tells us, it's because you trusted you had faith. It requires faith. You have to believe. But more than just belief, it requires conviction that leads to a life change, a willingness to follow Christ because you trusted in what? The word is there, the Greek word is energia, which means the mighty power of God. Because you trusted in the mighty power of God, this word energia is used in the New Testament only for superhuman power, whether God or of the devil. So we trusted in the superhuman power of God because nobody could be raised from the dead except God raised him. It's a miracle. I haven't seen anybody raised from the dead. I don't think you have either. It's a miracle. And you may be asking yourself, it's a miracle if it really happened. But because it would take a miracle to happen, and I didn't observe it, then you can't convince me that it happened. Well, some of you know that I'm also a lawyer, and I was a prosecutor for 10 years and put on evidence. There was a jury of 12 people who did not witness the crime. But I was charged with convincing them beyond a reasonable doubt that what I had alleged as the prosecutor actually happened. So how would I do that? I couldn't say it happened because I didn't see it. So I'd have to bring in witnesses who would testify under oath, under penalty of perjury, that in fact, what I wanted them to say happened actually did. And the jury would have to make a decision. Do I believe them or not? And we know in our system that a man's or a woman's life hangs in the balance. They could be executed for a crime based on the testimony of one witness. Well, the Bible tells us, Paul tells us, that after Jesus was crucified and buried, he was clearly dead. That after three days, he rose from the dead and was seen by over 500 witnesses. So you might say, I don't believe it, but that would be like a juror who would not be willing to fulfill their oath. Because you can reject the truth, but it doesn't change that it's truth. So we have an individual who not only predicted his own death and the manner in which he would die, but he predicted that he would rise in three days. And he pulled it off. He pulled it off. Don't you think that he's worthy to be believed? If you say that... 
and you proved it with your actions, with this miracle, I think I want to follow you. I'm with you. (laughs) I'm with you. And then his disciples proceeded to change the world as a result of what? As a result of their faith, right? As a result of their commitment, right? No. It's as a result of rising to new life in Christ and being filled with the very Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead. That Spirit resides in every follower of Jesus. That's what Jesus said. And again, he already proved that he was trustworthy. So if he says, it's better for you that I go away because the Holy Spirit will come and live in you, I believe him. The mighty power of God, do you believe that? The mighty power of God raised Jesus from the dead. If you trust and you believe in that, then Paul says, then then you have been raised to new life by the one who raised him from the dead. And the word there for, for him, it speaks of himself. So he raised himself from the dead. He was God. And then we go on to Colossians 2, 13 to 14. And I love this because as a lawyer, I love legal language. And this is legal language. When you were dead, so Paul is saying before you were a Christian, you were all dead. And I want you to think of somebody who is on death row. They have the sentence of death because they have been convicted legally, sentence was imposed, and they are awaiting a certain death. So Paul is saying all of us who were born in this world, that we were born to die. We were born with the sentence of death upon us because we were born in sin. We were born as a result of Adam's sin. We were born in sin. All of us are sons and daughters of Adam. Adam, we know when he sinned, the Bible tells us he essentially, what he did was he made himself a slave now to Satan. He gave the authority that he had, had been given by God, he gave that over to Satan and became a slave to the devil. And so as a result, everyone born to a slave is also a slave. So by birth, we, Paul says, were dead. We had a sentence of death upon us. You were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh. And then not only is it the sin of Adam imputed to us, but it's our own sin. You can ask yourself, you can look in the mirror and say, have I ever told a lie? And you can look at things that you have done and you realize, like me, if you're honest, that yes, you've done things that you regret. But Paul is saying, so not only was sin imputed to you, but you sin, every one of us sins. So you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive with Christ. You were dead. He made you alive. Well, how did that happen? Goes on to tell us. Because he forgave us all our sins. How did he do that? How can you cancel the sentence of death? It's a legal sentence, Paul. God is a just God. If he imposed that sentence, then shouldn't that sentence be fulfilled? Yes, it in fact should. But how? It's by Jesus, who in human form was God who lived a life of 33 years on this earth without sin. So, and since he was not a son of Adam, he was not imputed with sin. And since he never sinned, he was perfect and not under the sentence of death. But he chose to die. For you and for me. 
He chose to die so that that sentence that we face is satisfied if we trust in him, if we trust in the mighty power of God. So he says, your sins have, he forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. As a prosecutor, I had the responsibility of charging people with crimes. I would sit and read a police report. I would say, does it look like a crime has been committed based on what I know the law says? Then I would look, does it appear as though there's probable cause to believe that the person who was arrested committed that charge or that crime? And if so, I would prepare a legal document, an arrest warrant, complaint, sign it. That person would then, based on that warrant, that would ultimately be signed by a judge, would be arrested brought to jail, brought to court. The evidence would be presented. And more often than not, they'd be found guilty. And once they were guilty, a sentence was imposed, and they had to serve the sentence. There was no other way around it. And that's just. We see that as just as not one of us would ever say that if one of our family members had been raped or abused and the perpetrator arrested, that simply because the perpetrator stood before the judge and said, I'm sorry, look at all the other good things I've done, that somehow that might be a reason for that perpetrator to go free. No, a just judge would say, you should be sorry. And the law requires that as a result of your guilt, that you be sentenced and you satisfy this sentence. And in the case of a murder or a life sentence, or they're sentenced and they go off to jail and maybe to their execution. But can you imagine that person who had been sentenced to death was sitting on death row. Somebody walks in one day, the jailer walks in and says, Joe, you're free to go. What are you talking about? Your debt to society has been canceled. You're free to go. And I bet Joe would say, you're lying to me and close that cell door <laughs> because that's impossible. Nobody would ever let me go. It reminds me of my son. Recently, my son, Luke, was uh, uh, admitted into law school. And we were thanking God for that. He was admitted into law school. And he gets this letter from the law school that says, you get a full scholarship. You don't have to pay for anything. A full scholarship. And he looked at it, couldn't believe it, and didn't believe it. And, and his mother and I also were, didn't believe it right away. And he has two older brothers who themselves are lawyers and been to law school and have a huge law school debt. So they didn't believe it. <laughs> but whether or not he believed it, we checked it out and it was true. It was true. He was awarded a full scholarship. So what I'm saying to you is that what is promised to us, we may not believe. It may be too good to be true. So you go back to what did Jesus do to prove that he is truthful and to be believed. He said, if you don't believe me for my words, then believe me for the things that I've done to prove to you that what I say is true. So Paul is saying he canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. Every one of us were born with a birth certificate that said you are sentenced to die. Every one of us, not a one, escapes that. So how? The word canceled here means obliterated just obliterated the charges, erased them forever. How, Paul? How did Jesus do that? And he tells us, he has taken it away. 
nailing it to the cross. He has taken your legal indebtedness away for those who have trusted in Jesus, trusted in the mighty power of God. He's taken it and he's nailed it to the cross. And I want you to think of this. This is what he's offering you and me. And for those of us who have followed and said yes to Jesus, this is what he's done for you and me. That the charges that Satan would want to hold up and say, but remember what you did? Remember the bad that you have done? You are guilty. But like our four who have trusted in Christ and trusted in the mighty power of God, Jesus has canceled their debt. Canceled it, obliterated it by nailing it to the cross. And I want you to think about this. Think about what he offers us. New life. It's not, I am the same person who now believes. I'm the same person who just follows. No. That old man, he says, is dead and buried. When you follow Jesus, when you accept him, his spirit comes to live in you and you are born again. You are a new person. And yes, he's alive in you and in me now. We were raised together with him. He nailed it to the cross. And I'm going to try to do that. So, but I want you to get this image and just think about what he's done. The charges against you and me required death. But only the death of an innocent man would satisfy And Jesus, the only one ever born without sin. He's the only one who could take your debt, this indebtedness, this legal indebtedness. That debt has been paid. Your debt and mine has been paid if you trust in Jesus. And so the question is, do I believe God or not? Do I believe Jesus or not? Well, if it requires belief, who else might I believe over him? Nobody. There's nobody ever who has ever lived that is more trustworthy as a witness than Jesus Christ. So he says, I did that for you because I love you. Because I love you. Because the Father in heaven loves you. And now... When you have been crucified and buried and raised to new life with Christ, you now live with him forever and ever and ever. You are his. And I don't care what Satan or anybody else says. You say, no, I am no longer yours. I am a new creation, a new person, a new creature in Christ. John the Baptist said this, and we'll end with this. I baptize you with water. I baptize you with water. But he who is mightier than I is coming. He's talking about Jesus. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That's what he promises to each of us. And that's what he has done for our four friends and for us. Baptism is a public declaration of faith in Jesus. That's what he requires. If you want to follow me, you have to make it public. Don't be ashamed of me. So we're going to have today, the way it'll work with we proceed to our baptisms, is you will see video testimonies from each of the four who will be baptized. After a video testimony, we'll conduct the baptism, and we'll have another video testimony and another baptism. And then we'll celebrate at the end. So let's have our first video. Quite the journey this has been, and thank you for letting me share it with you. Um, This has been extraordinary 
and, and, and what I mean by that is by finding um, the Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ and sharing it with you all. Before finding Christ, um, I had been trying to fill this hole in my heart uh, for the longest time, and it wasn't God. Um, filling it with um, love from people, outside things, um, work, a job that required um, lots of hours. Um, growing up in an atheist home, I didn't know anything about Jesus Christ. I thought I could do everything myself. And here, 48 years later, I realized I couldn't. What I had been searching for this whole time, through all of these external things and people and events that I thought I could find true love, I couldn't. And it wasn't until now that you've shown me here at the home church that I now find true acceptance and love through our Father, one that I've never had. Um, our home from the outside looked wonderful, right? My mom was a, a, a school teacher. Um, my dad was a hardworking blue-collar guy, man, um, doing the best they could with what they knew, they thought, they, they knew, they knew how. It all lacked our Father in heaven, our Lord Jesus Christ. And there was always that hole that I didn't know was missing until probably my adulthood. And I saw others that had this love and aura about them, and I still didn't know what it was until some of my friends and family found our Lord Jesus Christ, and I started putting it together, and I wanted what they had. And it's just love. It's love and the teachings and the guidance, um, and it's the acceptance. I have so much to learn, but I'm excited to do it, and I'm excited to do it with you. So today, I'm here to share and express my love for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm here to express it through our baptism and share it all with you. Thank you for this moment. Todd, this water is warm. It is warm. <laughs> so, Todd, it's good to get to meet you. And uh, this has been a journey, a, a very sweet, sweet journey. And we've had the privilege of, of walking together with Todd over the last 10, 11 weeks at our home. And, and uh, I'm telling you, Todd has got such great joy. And... Uh, so, Todd, it's, a, it's with great joy and privilege that um, I get to baptize you today. And uh, I'm going to ask you a question before your family here, your friends and loved ones. Todd, do you declare today that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? I do, with all my heart. Well, then. Because of that declaration, that public declaration of faith, then it's with great joy that I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I 
am very excited to be here today, and it's, it's quite a miracle that I am. I am almost 55 years old, and I've lived most of my life as an atheist. I was married for 20 years, uh, raising four kids, a beautiful wife. A few years ago, she was diagnosed with a very rare uh, cancer. And uh, I, you know, I was not a believer and did not have anywhere to turn to. So <clears throat> uh, I, I started drinking fairly heavily at that point. She passed away, unfortunately, and um, my, my drinking kind of took on a life of its own. I didn't know how to deal with the anguish, and um, I drank myself to a point where I wanted to uh, kill myself. I lost the will to live. And uh, the day I did it, the day I was going to do it, obviously I haven't done it yet, but uh, God saw fit to, uh, to, to, to save my life. And I didn't realize it was God at the time. And at that point, I started to look for God. And uh, I started to see um, that there was more to life than that I could see with my own eyes and ears. But there was more and more evidence. And God saw fit to uh, bring another woman into my life and, and put those stepping stones in front of me and led me to this beautiful woman named Libby, who I married last year. She is a believer. She's renewing her uh, faith in Christ uh, along with me. I'm a, I'm a new believer, obviously. <laughs> and, um, and the way we found home church is incredible. Uh, her nephew, uh, Nathan, who is a special needs boy, he was invited last March to an event called Night to Shine. And it was hosted at the home church in Campbell, uh, along with many other churches. I had never been in the home church. I, I never even went to church. Um, my wife tried to take me to churches all the time. I, I didn't really want to go. But Nathan went, and it was life-changing for him. He had a really great experience, and he uh, called my wife the next day and said, uh, Aunt Libby, can you take me back to this home church on Sunday? And my wife said, well, let me ask Dean. And she said, do you want to go to church with Nathan on Sunday? And I rolled my eyes. I was like, mm, not really. You know, I didn't really like church that much. And, um, and I was a believer in God, but I, I wasn't really, uh, I, I was, certainly wasn't a Christian. And when it came to churches, it wasn't my thing. Um, but she said something to me that I'll never forget. My wife said, what if God is working through Nathan to get you to the church that day. What if there's a reason for you to be there? And I thought, yeah, you know, I think you're right. I should go. And about halfway through the service, I felt something settle on my body. It, it, it came down from, from above me, and it settled on me like a feather. And it went inside my body, and it filled my body with light. And I turned to my wife, and I said, there's something going on here. I got to find out what this is. And I knew Hector looked like an expert. He knew what he was talking about. So I thought I would go run over to Hector, and I did. And uh, I, was, I was in the lobby. I was like, Hector, Hector. And he said, hang on, hang on. Whoa, what's going on with you? You're like glowing. And I was like, really? And he's like, yeah. And so I told him my story. And, um, and we began to meet regularly. And what I felt that day was the Holy Spirit, and it was Jesus. And I have come to um, be a, a believer in Jesus Christ. I've accepted him into my heart as my Savior. And he has placed this stepping stone in front of me that led me to the home church. And I thank God for the home church, for Hector and Chrissy and all my family and friends. And I'm really looking forward to uh, taking many more steps on this journey with Jesus. Hey, Dean, that's a great story. 
And I tell you, when I heard it the first time, I was so excited. And we've just so enjoyed getting to know Dean, getting to know you and your wife, Libby, and, and all of your friends. And what a, what a privilege it is today, Dean, to be able to. Dean told me the other day that he, he said after he felt the Holy Spirit come upon him and that he felt like God had told him, you got to get baptized right away. Well, it's been a few months, so, and I just hope God doesn't hold it against me for waiting as long as we waited, but we actually had some time together and did some study, and, and now he's ready. So, Dean, I'm going to ask you a question, and that question is, before your friends and family, before everyone here today, do you declare that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Today, I turn my heart and my will over to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That's fantastic. Oh, before I got to say it on the mic. So I am going to now, it's with great privilege, that I get to now baptize you in the name of God our Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I wanted to let you all know about my the beginning of my walk with Christ and how that went. Um, had a, a period of darkness before I came to know the Lord, and that what that looked like um, was uh, depression, alcoholism, and suicide. And um, through prayer, I heard, I felt. A divine intervention. In 2012, I reached a crossroad where I was either going to live or die, and um, I said a prayer. And I said, "Dear Lord, let me live. Show me my purpose. Enough suffering. Please grant me ease and comfort." And since that day, um, I've not. I my battle with alcoholism seized and I am I'm in recovery and that's been six years I got married about a year and a half ago and um, I have a God a God sister and we often uh, walk and talk and talk about God and and our relationship with God and what's going on in our life and scripture and and last year she got baptized and um, and I got to see her baptism and she, when we were walking the beginning of this year, she said, Libby, I think that it's, it's on my heart to tell you I think it's your time for, to get baptized. And I've been praying about it because my husband wasn't following the same spiritual path that I was following. And so I've been praying for my husband since I've known him, three years now. We're coming up on our baptism, and this is something... I wanted to get baptized this year. I feel like it's the Lord really speaking to me now about obedience and walking forth and um, not being afraid to say what I believe in. And what I believe is the Lord Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and I want everyone to know. So Libby, come on in. Take these stairs here. It's a little easier. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Dean's going to help. Dean is her husband. He's going to stay in here and help baptize her. So. Right here. Well, Libby, it's a joy to, to know you and to, to hear your testimony. What a blessed, blessed testimony it is and a journey. And it's so, it's what a privilege to be able to be included by God in that journey. To, to be given the privilege 
to baptize the two of you, to, to be able to witness the man that you prayed for standing next to you and helping me as your spiritual leader in your household, helping me baptize you. So Libby, I'm going to ask you a question. It's a question I ask all, all those who are being baptized today. Before your friends and family, do you declare, to, declare today that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? A hundred percent, yes. <laughs> okay. Well, then, because of that declaration, I have the privilege of baptizing you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I was raised as a Christian. My uh, parents took me to church when I was younger. Uh, I did always believe in God, um, but my parents were alcoholics, and when you're raised by alcoholics, uh, it's very chaotic, and you can lose a lot of uh, being taught morals and values and how to cope with life and, and to be in the world. Um, and by the time I was 14, I had a turning point where I started partying with my friends in high school like teenagers do, and um, I, I stopped praying. When I was 19 years old, um, I was able to get together with some of my family members, my uncles, who were uh, very devout Christians, and um, I went to church with them, and that was the beginning of uh, going into adulthood, raising my daughter, um, and life showing up and just getting a job and doing all those things that we do. I, I did, I, when I look back, I feel like I had a spiritual malady, a, a God-shaped hole in my heart. And um, by the time I was in my 30s, um, I was going through a divorce. Uh, my father had died from alcoholism. My brother was hit by a car and killed by a drunk driver. Uh, some other events that went on in this very, very short period of time in my 30s. And, um, and what I did was I defaulted back to what I had learned in my childhood and I started drinking. I quickly found out that, that I do suffer from alcoholism. And so in my journey of recovery over the last five years, I did reconnect with God, and um, I've been growing my connection to God, and I accepted Jesus into my heart, and and I had what was a, what I consider a very good connection, um, but I knew I needed to do more, and so I, I found home church with my husband, and um, I met Chrissy and Hector, and um, over these last months. Um, of doing this uh, starting point uh, series with them and just learning more, I knew that I needed to take that next step. So I am here to demonstrate and to make a public declaration that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. So I'm going to invite uh, Tracy and Rick. Rick is her husband, who is uh, a believer, and he's going to help me baptize Tracy. Tracy, come on in. Yeah. Well, Tracy, that uh, is a special declaration of faith, and I know you've been... Um, your life's journey has not been easy. Uh, but what you have uh, told us today is that Jesus has led you here and that he has changed your life. And I know that uh, Rick is overjoyed at what he has seen come to pass in you 
and uh, the privilege that he has of now having a wife who is a follower of Jesus like he is. And it's been a joy to watch the two of you love one another and love Christ. So I'm going to ask you, presence of family and friends, do you declare today that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? 100%. And so because of that, public declaration of your faith in Christ. And it's with great joy and privilege that in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit that I baptize you today.